That takes us to our next and final speaker, Ms. Petra Acél. Ms. Petra Acél is a full professor of communication and rhetoric at the Corvinus University of Budapest and head of the Institute of Behavioral Science and Communication Theory, as well as member of the Social Communication Doctoral School. Her research interests are focused on the theory and practice of interpersonal and public communications science communication, new media, and new media literacy. She is author of four and co-author of another four books and has published more than 200 publications on verbal and visual communication, rhetoric, media communication, and media literacy. Please welcome Ms. Atzel, who will be speaking to us on Social Futuring, a Discursive Framework. It does. Well, when did you, when did you last invent a word? Distinguished colleagues, accomplished guests, dear ladies and gentlemen, in fact, we are quite active in language creation. Uh, according to the Global Language Monitor, which is a silicon-based company, around 5,400 words are created every year. We all know master creators like Shakespeare in English or Kaczynski in Hungarian, uh, who stand up and held up as a master and great neologist. But you see, the question is here, what motivates us to find new words, new terms? Are the ones existing not okay, not fine, not enough for us to express, to envision, or to somehow reflect the complex phenomena of our changing world? Well, let's see first what the function of a new word or term can be. Uh, on the one hand, words and terminology speak for an age, a community, a period of culture. This is what culturomics, among many other approaches, investigate. Culturomics is a method, method of computational technology. It aims to explore cultural phenomena and changes as they are reflected in language. And in a recent study by Big Data's Michel and his colleagues, it showed us that our age, in a way, considering from the usage of words in previous ages, is a result of a future-oriented former age. That is, so they, what they did is that they did an analysis of uh, millions of digitized books in English. As a matter of fact, 4% of books printed in English between 1800 and 2000. Regarding the attitude to the past, they found that the texts were less and less about the past as historical time progressed, and more and more, yes, so past went out of fashion. And they were more and more about the newness, about future, about present, and novelties. So it's possible if you start from taking language and words and their dominance in a certain age that we are, our era is a future-oriented era or at least the result of it. But on the other hand, concepts, words and terms do not only reflect and transfer but create and transform ways of living. So in my view, finding a new bird is founding a new world with a bit of a poetic exaggeration. When we created, invented the term and concept and the definition and the frames of theory of social futuring you've become quite familiar with by this time, I guess, we didn't simply want to introduce a new entry to a dictionary and earn our 15 seconds with it, though we in a way tried and did but we intended to locate a new meaning into communication and start a new discourse because we know that we are in need of new meanings. And through this, we wished to create a symbolic space and a new configuration of meanings and bring into light a specific complex of phenomena to measure. So it's really important that we did that. 
it was really significant to, what, to find this term. And so what my talk wishes to do today is that I would like to show you uh, the justification why this new term was needed. Because when a new concept is created, we immediately face the challenge to prove that this step, this finding and founding, was inevitable, was a necessity. So I will highlight the similarities and differences the meaning of social futuring has with and from its kin terms, kin concepts. This is why I call this approach a discursive one. Kinship here is meant on the basis of cognitive linguistics, which suggests that a meaning is constituted and interpreted uh, by classification or prototyping, both using elements, subcategories of meaning. My presentation today centers around two main subcategories of the meaning of social futuring, that is ability and future. Within the conceptual category of ability, I will be showing briefly in what ways social futuring converge or diverge with and from resilience and capabilities both terms are the ones to which indices and measures belong. As for the category of future, I will dwell upon the intersections and differences of social futuring with and from concepts of future orientation and future proofing. Both are relevant terms of future studies. These four we singled out as key and quite broad concepts of the individual's prosperity the future orientation of society and culture and strategic planning, the ecological thinking and acting about successful and meaningful existence, to put it concisely. These existing terms, moreover, provide a fine sum of category elements that appear in the interpretation of social futuring as we see. These category meaning elements are the conception of change, how these terms conceive of change the attitude to change, vision, if it's a condition, uh, entity, agency, what kind of leveling is there, and action, whether it's mainly motivated or mainly strategic. So let's start. Uh, let's take resilience first. I, I know that all of you may be very familiar with this term, so it's going to be given to you today in a nutshell. Resilience in physics and ecology means an active resistance and rapid recovery. In people, it expresses the creative and flexible coping that involves learning and development and which helps people to find their way back to their original better state of mind in the face of difficulty. To put it simply, resilience refers to the ability to bounce back after encountering difficulty. So resilience is a coping strategy which has its own factors. Uh, in the RSEA Global Scales and Index of Resilience, they say that these factors are uh, how the, the individual and the community uh, takes challenges of reactivity, assertiveness, attachment, control, and problems. But Southwick and his colleagues, upon interviewing resilient subjects, gave a more detailed list of resilient factors, namely 10. And from these 10, one stands out, that is optimism. Okay, uh, optimism is the meaning element and category and a kind of factor that connects resilience to future. So optimism, again, very briefly, includes the individual's hope and confidence that the events to happen will be advantages for him and her. The intimate link between resilience and optimism is primarily reflected in the way as people think about the causes of things and events that affect them. So Seligman calls this the explanatory style. Depending on this type and on this style, attributive thinking may make the individual active or passive with respect to future events. And this was also proved in the experiments of learned helplessness. So, I'm very grateful that you're resilient enough to take, to take up with this ping pong for a long time. That's really a brave thing, thank you. Uh, well, there are 
several business indices uh, in optimism, uh, which convert to figures the short and long-term expectations and, and data of companies about sales, profit, growth, the number of staff, HR, whatever strategies. The problem here is that these indices definitely lack the psychological social aspect. So they will never ever focus on this kind of explanatory style or prototyping in any sense. So they do not or barely apply psychological research findings. Uh, I just listed two of these indices. One is about uh, the Indian um, market and the other is about the US market. Uh, but all in all, measures and indices of optimism and resi resilience emphasize the importance of managing and coping with distress disaster and the level of, and keeping the level of stability. Uh, what was important for us is whether we can call our project a resilience project. But what, what I want to show you is in what ways we think upon cognitive linguist analysis, social futuring is different from resilience. So they both do refer to an acting entity and they both express its capacity, potential, and character with respect to changes. At the same time, the two concepts differ in that resilience typically and primarily looks at change as a disruption of some predictable continuity. So it usually sees uh, change as a negative event, a type of shock or stress, danger, that must be tolerated. While social futuring interprets change in three ways. And you could see on Dr. Santo's slides that we are very, very for this creative, this adaptive, and this productive aspect as well. Uh, so in a way, what I see and how I see is that social futuring is more visionary than resilience and more habitual than resilience. So re resilience is about a, a bit of or a unit of behavior, but social futuring in that sense is more holistic. Now let us turn to the second term, that is capabilities. Uh, Janos Chak mentioned in his presentation this morning that I will talk about it in a len more lengthy way. Uh, in fact, I promise you that it's going to be again done quite briefly. Capabilities is a specific term that belongs to the capabilities theory uh, based, figured, and framed by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum. Uh, Sen conceives of capabilities as uh, substantial freedoms and Nussbaum as capabilities, so it's a kind of the freedom and the opportunity to act. Uh, capabilities can be internal and combined. Internal ones are trained or developed traits or abilities developed and improved in interaction with the familial, economic, political environments. Like, okay, this can be suing or this can be a communication skill or a political skill or, or at least having just fun or joy in, in having your healthy life. Now, combined ones are different. They are the conditions given to function and to brought out your capabilities. So they are the conditions provided to function in accordance with those capacities. And functioning is the active realization of one or more capabilities. So capabilities seem to be very close uh, semantically to social futuring. However, if you see the Human Development Index, you see the main and seminal difference, the significant diversity diverging of these two, uh, because the Human Development Index uh, is based on the, uh, the, the, the assumption that the people and their capabilities should be the ultimate criteria for accessing the development of a country and not economic growth alone. But what they measure in their indicators are quite different if you take the normative standards that you've just become familiar with in this morning. Because what, how they see the human being is that the human being is an individual in given conditions. He or she is wanting to have a long and healthy life. And the main point here is being knowledgeable. Now that's, 
That's one stand, and as the HDI says, its intellectual and philosophical stand is explicitly value pluralist and politically liberal. But that also means that we can make a nice comparison semantically. So if you have social futuring here and, um, and capabilities there, you see that both are dealing, both terms and concepts are dealing with the quality of life, but the two see that differently. So these are the, just the, how they put the emphasis on the individual. So capabilities is very much about the individual and the functioning of the individual and not the social, uh, social uh, identity. But now I show you because I, uh, I was just keeping you waiting. So this is how, uh, this, is how this kind of comparison can be, can be made. And now we are, we are trying to get closer to reasoning or justifying why the term and concept social futuring was so much needed. You know, I'm dealing with rhetoric, so be aware of that. Uh, let's talk about the other uh, meaning dimension, future. In fact, when we started this project, we tended to use future orientation and future proofing as synonyms or as the terms that are going to be good for our project. And it took a considerable time for us to realize that what we want to denote with social futuring differs from what these two uh, uh, denote and show us. So, uh, future orientation uh, is the first that we, we cast light upon uh, this afternoon. It's a multi-dimensional process of motivation, planning and evaluation. Here, motivation means the individual's interest in the future. Planning means the way in which future goals are set and achieved. And evaluation means the extent to which a goal has been achieved. And yes, there are many, many things that show that future orientation is a, quite a broad concept, quite a broad meaning, and, but it's mainly about the attitude of humans towards the future. Well, the future is very, very important for us, but only if we can imagine it. Because if we have a picture of it, a view of it, a vision of it, then we will be able to progress towards. So it's important to set the future goals and to arrange the possibilities of the future and, the, and then act in accordance. This is, as all authors say, are very, very distinctive features of humans. So human humans has this very specific kind of ability and attitude towards future that we can be oriented towards future. Now, uh, this future orientation is always highly cultural context, so culturally context. Just think simply about time and future in time, how differently cultures conceive of future in time. Um, in Western cultures, Again, I'm going to be very general and very simple. In Western cultures, time uh, is sequential, linear, and quantitative. The future is determined by the past and the present. By contrast, the non-Western mentalities do not break down time to abstract units and are more related to natural time. This concept of time is cyclical and reflects the life of nature. The focus is always on the present and the future doesn't necessarily mean the new, but the recurring. I'm not saying that history repeats itself. Uh, but there is a third one uh, that's, that's given to these two types these days. And this is uh, what we call the social cultural time. Uh, social cultural times imagines the future as something that, not is that is not brought by the passage of moments, but by the achievement of our goals, by performance or success. Uh, just my, my ideas are coming from, from uh, Barabash Obet Lasso's presentation, that's why I mentioned these two words. So in this third view of time and future, the past and the future depend on behaviors, habits in the present. And the future penetrates into the present through acts, decisions, and discourses. Uh, the future, there is a future orientation index, which is 
quite an interesting one because it explores future orientation and human trends of information search by looking at Google searches with years in Arabic numbers. I'm sorry I'm not going to talk about in a more lengthy way uh, about this index because I think it has the specificity of uh, language and numeration kind of features, so it's, it may be unfit for those cultures that are bound differently to language and, and numbers, but it seems quite a, an interesting input for, for us um, in social futuring as well. Now, what is different and what is similar between future orientation and future pr uh, social futuring? Uh, this is uh, what I would like to allow you to consider. They both share the approach to the future as an essential category. Vision is a common feature of both, but the um, difference is that future-proofing is more of a disposition and awareness than a strategy. Another difference is that future orientation generally comprehends the future as a perspective in time, whereas social future comprehends it as a way of coping with changes, though they do converge in the conception of futurist performance, so in the third option that I just listed. And let us remain for a short while uh, in the future, and let's deal with future-proofing. Now, this was the term that we really start off as that, 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 that we would like to use this. Future proofing is going to be fine for us. I can recall those February meetings when Janos told me that, okay, if you, it's going to be future proofing. You know, Petra, it's, it's future proofing. And it, again, I have to repeat, it took us some time to see that, no, that's not enough. That, that not, may not be the word that describes our founded world. So, uh, the term future-proofing first emerged in the last century within the context of data storage and computer electronic planning. And the primary consideration for future-proofing, and later on it, it became a very important word in architecture, the primary consideration for future-proofing was and is to create technology spread endurance and safety with flexible systems. Its method is foresighting, not forecasting, but foresighting, uh, and road mapping, uh, giving future narratives, future stories of what is meant, what is hoped, or what is feared to come. Well, in general, future proofing is the strategic procedure of looking into the future, having narratives of it, and developing methods to minimize the negative effects and to benefit from the positive effects of sudden, unexpected changes. Future-proofing uh, mainly and primarily expresses protection resistance to the negative effects of future and typically a kind of successful preservation in time and adaptation to change accordingly. So it's a far-sighted planning for minimizing the risks of his investments, and it's mainly about the preservation and the preparation for change, securing the, the existing entity and the existing technology. So again, there are many, many things that correlate or, or show similarities between these two notions. However, and we all see that future-proofing seems to be the strategy of resilience. But what, what's quite clear, and it's, it's a great difference here, is that by, uh, by future or, uh, proofing is dealing with institutions like states, the future proofing of states or organizations. It's not dealing with the social. So for us, it wasn't cultural enough. It wasn't social enough. And there's a, a, a deeper analysis in my article in it but yes, it seemed that for us, there's something broader needed. And so that's why we started, or I started to say that resilience may not be visionary enough for us. Future proofing may not be, uh, future orientation, sorry, may not be strategic for us enough. Uh, you see the intersections here that I mentioned Future-proofing may not be cultural enough, and capabilities 
capabilities may not be social and normative enough. I really wanted to show you the newness and the need to establish a new term in our case. And this is in summary in this figure. And you see that we are very happy that we have a full line of dots. And not the, the preceding ones could not do that for, for us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is my summary. And I started with language creation and creating a new term. What I tried to do to show you with my cognitive linguist analysis is that in social proofing, with social proofing, we not only want to just somehow mark certain complex phenomena for measure, but we would like to make a discursive oikaiosis, a discursive home finding. Thank you for, for being with us today and sharing the ideas and debating with us about it. I'm grateful for your attention. Thank you.